lesson is 1 John chapter 4 and verse number 4. Ah, I love that verse. And uh, uh, it says, uh, you are of God. And, and what he's saying is, hey, you are not of the world. You are a child of of God. I mean, think about that for just a moment. You are a, a child of God. He says, let's say it together. 1 John 4, 4. Repeat it with me. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Isn't that a great verse? Greater is he that is in you. You have overcome them. Who? Well, as you're going to see here in just a moment, um, he's talking again about false teachers. Now, uh, uh, I want to remind you to keep on working at the other verses that I've given to you in each chapter. The first one was 1 John 1.9. And uh, then 1 John 2.15 and 16. And then we just finished with 1 John 3, 18. Again, if you work hard, Greg said he will take you out to dinner if you can repeat all six verses. Now, I'm going to reward you somehow. I think I'll, I'll uh, let you come and clean my house or something like that. You know, you know, something. <laughs> oh, boy. All right. But... <laughs> All right. Um, uh, let's go ahead and read our text. I'm going to uh, try to get through verse number three. Uh, so, now remember, uh, John is writing to who? He's writing to Christians, isn't he? And his purpose throughout this letter, he has wanted to encourage them in their faith. We all need encouragement, don't we? Now he begins chapter 4 here by revisiting a truth that he has talked about several times throughout his letter. And one thing you'll learn about John is that he likes to repeat certain core truths. For example, throughout his letter he repeatedly returns to the subject of loving one another. In fact, in this chapter, chapter 4, look what he says in, in verse number 7. He says, Beloved, let us love one another. Verse 11, Belo Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. And uh, uh, verse number 20, I was going to use that as a memory verse. If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. Verse 21, that he who loveth God love his brother also. So he repeats it over and over. Why do you think he does that? <laughs> it's because we need reminded over and over um, to love one another. So let's read our text here. And uh, beginning in verse number one, beloved, beloved, be believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Um, you can even replace the word spirit there with false teachers or false prophets. Hereby know you the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesseth that who? Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. Oh my soul, I would underline that. That is probably one of the most powerful verses in Scripture. And you'll see why here in just a few minutes. And this is that spirit of Antichrist where you have heard that it should come. And even now, already, is it in the world. All right, take your outlines out, all right? Now, he begins chapter 4 by telling the church, as he has done numerous times, he tells them and reminds them that he loves them. 
He uses the word beloved or beloved. In fact, three times throughout his letter here, John reminds his readers that he loves them. I think that it's important that a pastor shows love to those in the congregation. Can I let you on in a little secret? Yes. Okay, thank you, Greg. Okay. One of the reasons that I don't go to a lot of pastors' luncheons or breakfasts is because of how they talk about those in their church. They share stories of what this person or that person has done. And I get so tired of it. And um, pastors ought not to do that. And John doesn't seem to do that, does he? He taught his people over and over to love one another with the love of Christ. And here he's expressing as a pastor, his, his love to them by telling them that they're beloved. Not only beloved by him, but it reminds them that they're beloved of God. I, I thought about answering the phone and as I hang up and tell people, just want to remind you that God loves you. And, uh, um, but anyway, now... As you know, John took his job as a pastor very seriously. And his job was to protect the flock or protect the church mostly from heresy or mainly from heresy. And so here in verse number one, look at your outline. What does John warn the church to do in verse number one? He says, beloved Believe not every spirit. What does he mean by that? He's telling them, listen, don't believe everything that you hear. It's exactly what he's saying. He is warning his congregation, and he's also, as a good warning for us, to be careful. John understands how important it is to realize that you can't believe everything that you hear. You know that statement, if it's on the internet, it must be true. <laughs> That's not so. You can't believe everything that is said to come from God. You can't believe everything that is supposedly biblical. You just can't automatically believe all Christian pastors or Christian evangelists or teachers. You cannot believe all who claim to speak in the name of God. You just can't. Over the past several years, we've been hearing a new phrase that has been quite popular, especially in the last few months. And I'm sure you've heard it. How many have heard the phrase fake news? I mean, we've heard it all, uh, you know, and. uh there's a lot of stories coming out recently that are claiming that it was our president, Donald Trump, who originated the phrase. But that, too, is, is uh, fake news. That's not true. It's been around before him. But I will say that um, he did not origina originate the phrase, but he has certainly made it popular, hasn't he? By, by claiming um, that the media has been giving fake news stories or misrepresenting the truth uh, for political gains. Anyway, fake news, by definition, is just stories that are found to be purposely misleading. And in the information age that we're living in, and we do live in an information age, don't we? I mean, we have Facebook, uh, Twitter, and, and my son told me about Instagram and, and uh, all of those things. And the Internet is just full of fake news, misrepresentation of the, of the truth. And I just happened to go online and find a couple of, uh, you got to tell me whether this is fake news or not, all right? The first one, this came from a popular Christian magazine. This is where I found it, in a Christian magazine. 
The article told about some drilling that took place over in Russia where they went so deep that they said that they actually thought that they had drilled into hell. And it was repeated by various sources that they heard the cries and shrieks of those who were in torment there. Is that fake news or is that true? How many think that's true? Oh, good. i got a great congregation out here. Because if Randy, if you'd raise your hand, we'd have a, a talk over in the office. Now, this one, you got to tell me if it's fake news or not. A man from Waterbury in Connecticut faces divorce after his wife found out that he was not actually deaf and had been faking it for more than 62 years to avoid having to listen to her. <laughs> so how many would say that that's true? <laughs> All the guys raised their hand. <laughs> Um, now, while he may, what's that? <laughs> now, while he may not want to listen to his nagging wife, the story is not true. Um, and one fake news story almost caused a tragedy. This has happened just two years ago on Sunday, December 4th. And it, it had to do with what we call Pizzagate. Anybody hear about what Pizzagate was? Um, is an actual uh, incident that did occur at a pizza shop in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, but the story came out that the pizza shop, and this is what was fake about it, was the base for human trafficking involving Democratic presidential candidate Hillary Clinton and members of her campaign. Supposedly, some of her Hillary's emails leaked information about the human trafficking at this pizza shop. And so the pizza shop, now this, this is part of the, this actually took place. Now it's a false story, but this took place. The pizza shop began receiving threats from right-wing wing activists. And, uh, and in fact, um, a 28-year-old man from North Carolina showed up at the pizza shop with a rifle to free the children and people who were involved in the human trafficking. They arrested him. Nobody was shot or killed, but, but uh, that's what fake news did. I mean, that's how it originated. And then the other day, I'll, I'll give you one more, but my, I was talking with my son, and, and uh, uh, somebody said, hey, he's growing a beard like you are. And so I Jared asked me if he wanted to, if he should shave, and I said, well, Jared, you'll get a tougher beard if you keep shaving it. He looked at me, and, and he had no idea. He said, Dad, that's fake news. <laughs> that's, it's a myth. It's a myth. Uh, anyway, fake stories are plentiful. Now, how do you know which ones are true and which ones are not? Well, some are so outlandish that you know they're not true, right? But some have an element of truth in them to make the story, you know, seem plausible. But if you want to know if a story is true or not, you don't just accept it. You have to do your research, right? And, and, and determine where the source is coming from. And there's a lot involved in that. So look at number two in your outline. What does John tell the church to do in order to distinguish what is true and what is false? You see, and we've covered this, inside of the church, there were teachers who were teaching false doctrine. And so what does he tell them to do in verse number one? Look at it. Don't believe every prophet, every spirit, or prophet that's inspired by a spirit, but what? Try the spirits. Circle that word try. That means to test or to examine where the truth is coming from. What John is saying is that we need to examine what is being said. Does it come from the, listen to this, the Spirit of God, or, do, or whether the doctrine comes from the Spirit of the devil? And I'm going to explain that. He's saying, um, look 
at where the doctrine is coming from. Look at the person also who is, who is uh, teaching or preaching. From what spirit is he? That is the text here. That's what he is saying. Now, it can only come from two sources. That's important to understand. It can either come from the Holy Spirit or it can come from the devil. In fact, look at verse number 3. He said, there are those spirits that come that are not from God, but are from the spirit of who? The Antichrist. In verse number 3. Error or false doctrine always comes from the spirit of the Antichrist. It comes from Satan. False doctrine always originates from the devil. I can't wait to give you this verse here in a moment. This past week, I received a phone call from a ministry called Adam's Road. And I'll tell you, it is an absolutely wonderful ministry. And if you have time this week, I would look up the ministry. I just happened a few weeks ago to listen to a YouTube testimony of Adam. I was so impressed with it that I just knew I had to invite him to come here and, uh, and to be with us. And so they were returning my call. Anyway, their testimony is powerful. They, they are so booked up that I can't get him till uh, next summer, but we have it booked. But he shares how he was raised as a Mormon. His mother was a professor at Brigham Young University, and his father was one of the high priests in the Mormon temple. And his whole life was involved around the Mormon faith. And while he was on his two-year mission, and again, all young people who go through, uh, uh, who graduate from high school, are expected to go on a two-year mission. Well, on this mission, this young man met a preacher, a Baptist preacher, who talked with him about the true gospel. And... Uh, he explained to him how that we're saved by grace and not by our works. Well, this preacher made such an impression that by the time this young man was finished with his mission, as a Mormon missionary, he got saved. And his first testimony was in front of hundreds of Mormons. At the end of, at the end of their mission, they all gathered together at one place, and they're asked this question in front of all their Mormon peers and, and the elders of the church. What did you learn on this mission trip? And <laughs> so he boldly, he said shakingly, he told them that he learned that you can only be saved through the blood of Jesus Christ, not through the Mormon gospel. He immediately was expelled from the church. The church actually went to his parents and said that he had a demon and that he was possessed. And, but listen to this. Through his testimony, his mother and his father and all of his brothers became Bible-believing Christians through this man's testimony. And again, look it up. Look at Adam's testimony. You'll be, you'll be just shocked. It, it is so powerful. Adam's Road. Now, um, anyway, as you listen to the testimony, um, it, it, as I said, it's powerful. Anyway, on the phone, I had a few questions for him. And uh, so I talked with him and... And I told him how my family had converted to Mormonism. And, uh, um, and here's what he said. He said that the Mormon religion is full of inconsistencies and the teachings are false. He said it is a counterfeit doctrine. And here is the statement. I told that whole story. I probably shouldn't have. But he said that many people are being seduced 
because of seducing spirits and doctrines of the devil. I said, man, I've heard that before. Where did I hear it before? Look at number four in your outline. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 1. Here's what Paul says, that many people would depart from the faith by listening and adhering to what kind of spirits? Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. We're actually told that people can believe doctrines of devils. That's why I want you to come to see the American gospel tonight. We are seeing in some of these, even mega churches that preach a, a prosperity gospel, that are believing doctrines of devils. Now, I'm, I'm going to explain that. Well, they, they preach salvation. Yes, they may, but I'm going to show you what John says here. It's going to blow your socks off this morning. But we can be I I introduced. And so... What I'm saying is, when he says, don't believe every spirit, he said these prophets who speak can be inspired by the Holy Spirit or inspired by the doctrines of demons. That's what he says. And in verse number one, he said, you got to examine the spirits because look at number five in your outline. What does he say that there are a lot of in the world? There's a lot of false prophets out there. That was true back then, and it's certainly true today, isn't it? Jesus said the same thing. He said, you better be careful, because don't let any man deceive you, for there are many false Christ and false prophets. He said, listen, and, and there is a church on almost every corner. There are so many different voices out in the world today trying to get your attention, trying to distract you. And there's so many voices out there. You had better learn how to distinguish between what is true and what is false. So how can you, how can you avoid being swept away by deception? Well, he's going to help us. Look what he says in this next verse. Number six in your outline, what test does John give in verses two and three to test these teachers to see if their message is truly from God? And here it is. I'm going to fill in the blank. Then we'll read the verse. Does the teacher accept Jesus' full humanity as being man and his full deity of being 100% God. Now, now, this is important. Look what it says. Now, this is a good test. I call this test the test of Jesus' deity. Look what he says. Verse number 2. Hereby, this is how you're going to know that this teacher speaks from the Spirit of God. Every teacher, every spirit that confesses with his mouth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Now, there is a lot more to that statement. But he says, every spirit that says that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist. So if a teacher does not accept the truth about Jesus, what spirit does John say that his teaching is from? It's from the spirit of the Antichrist. We write this statement down. We must listen carefully to their treatment of who Jesus is. This is one of the most powerful, impacting statements. You see, I told you how that my sisters were deceived into believing a false gospel propagated by false apostles who claimed to be the ministers of Christ. 
My sisters embraced Mormonism. They embraced error and they missed heaven. Now listen to me. The Mormon doctrine sounds very much like what we believe today. You go on line and you find what the Mormons believe and you would think that it came right out of uh, our website of what we believe. Right down the line. Here's an example of what they have done. Now, does this sound accurate to you? <clears throat> Mormons believe that Jesus Christ is literally the Son of God, the Savior and Redeemer who died for the sins of humankind and rose from the dead on the third day God, uh, with an immortal body. God the Father also has an immortal body. Does that sound accurate to you? It does, doesn't it? Sounds just like what we believe. But what they neglect to tell you is what they believe about Jesus. They do believe that He is the Son of God, but they do not believe that He is the eternal Son of God, equal with the Father. They believe He was created. They believe that not only was Jesus created and became the Father's Son through a relationship, which is blasphemy, they also believe that Satan was created and that Jesus and Satan are brothers. Now, I gave you the example of what the Mormons believe about Jesus. According to what John says, we believe that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, but He was the eternal Son of God. He was eternal God. He was our Creator. They don't believe that. And I'm going to tell you this. What is being propagated today in our churches is through the prosperity gospel. Do you know, for example, one of the biggest movements on our planet right now is, um, is Hillsong and Bethel Church. We're being taught, now listen to this, Bethel Church... They believe, and the prosperity gospel is teaching this... They have the same wording as we do, but they actually believe that Jesus, when He became man, was not God. But that we can become like Jesus, so then we can do the things that Jesus did, because He was only a man. That means that I have the power to command demons and healing, and therefore, whatever Jesus did, I can do because I am becoming like God. And that's exactly what is being taught out there. You have to be so very careful. That I, I, you know, we can't command God. These faith healers who line people up and say, in the name of Jesus, through the power, and you are healed. Person after person, legs being lengthened. Foolishness. And yet we're seeing millions of people out there. Or I can command to become rich. I mean, I don't have enough time to go into it. So from what spirit, according to John, where does that doctrine come from? It's the doctrine of devils. It's a perversion of the truth. Now, there's a lot of tests that we need to give also. There are other questions you need to ask. And offhand, and I don't have enough time, but let me just say this. So the first question is, what do they teach about the divinity of Jesus? I'm telling you, you cannot become like God. <laughs> that was a lie that was told in the, in the beginning in Adam and Eve. So what do they teach about the divinity of Jesus? What do they teach about salvation? Do you have to earn salvation through your personal efforts? No. But listen, what do they teach about the Word of God? Is it inspired by God? What do they believe about... Listen to this one. What do they believe about eternal security? Because if you get eternal security screwed up, you're going you're gonna to screw up the entire book of Romans. And you're going to misinterpret what... what what, what Paul teaches and what do they, what do they believe about healing let, let, let's move on alright and then in verse number in number 8 and I'm finished what does John say 
to affirm these believers concerning their doctrinal beliefs about Christ. Now, he's warned them, but look what he says here, and I want you to see this. He exposes these false teachers for who they are. Now he wants to encourage them in verse number four, your memory verse. He wants to reassure them. And he says, listen, you are of God. You're, you're not believing the, this, these, these false doctrines that are being propagated by these false spirits. You are of God, little children. And he goes on and he says, and you have overcome these false prophets. You've overcome them because the Holy Spirit who lives inside of you he is greater than he that is in the world. What do you mean? You believe salvation by grace. You believe that Jesus was fully man. Who led you into that truth? You're sitting here this morning embracing the full deity as Jesus Christ being the creator of the world and your Savior and Redeemer saved by grace. And he's saying, listen, you're of God. And the Holy Spirit is the one who led you into that. He could have, listen, you could have been influenced by the spirit of Antichrist and you could end up like many of my family who are out there in Utah embracing a false doctrine headed to hell. But it's by grace that you have overcome that. It's by the Holy Spirit who, Jesus said, he will lead you into all truth. And let me ask you this. What causes you to shake your head this morning and say, yes, what you're saying resonates with me? It's because you know that the Holy Spirit is teaching you and saying, he's not saying, what happened if I got up here and I said, listen, all those who want to get healed, uh, you just leave your $100 right there and I'll pray for you for you, and you'd say, that doesn't sound right, right? Could we try it though? You know, I mean, what I'm saying is, you know what resonates and what doesn't, and it's not because of your intellectual superiority. It's because you have him that is greater in you than he that is out there in the world, warning you against seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. You've overcome. Father, thank you for our time this morning. How powerful that we can examine what is being taught out there by this simple truth to examine the spirits, what they believe about the divinity of Jesus. Oh.